Hey, what's up guys? My name is Steve. Thank you for stopping by my channel. I'm just an American guy on a journey to discover my British and Irish ancestry. Today we're going to be reacting to the Pendle Witch Trial. Um, this video is actually entitled The Disturbing Witch Trial That Shook Britain, The Pendle Witch Child. I'm not really sure what the child has to do with this. I'm guessing um, they were probably some sort of witness. I'm not really sure though. Uh, the only thing I know about the Pendle Witches or the Pendle Witch Trial is that it supposedly is similar to what happened in Salem, Massachusetts here in the US. But beyond that, I don't have a clue what to expect with this video. Um, but, you know, I really enjoy learning about history like this, so uh, I felt like this would be a good video to go ahead and check out. By the way, one more thing I want to say is that if you notice the lighting is a little darker or it looks a little different, it's because it's a very dreary day here today, and uh, so the lighting was not very good. And so um, I've got a little bit of different lighting on. I don't particularly like this lighting that much, but, you know, it's what I got right now. So. Um, hopefully that'll improve at a later time. Anyways, guys, enough rambling. Let's go ahead and uh, check out um, the disturbing witch trial that shook Britain, the Pendlewitch child. It's 1612 and a woman is in a courtroom. She's accused of killing three men through witchcraft. Mm -hmm. She's presented with a confession that she denies. But then, a girl is brought to testify against her. The girl bursts into tears as the woman screams at her desperately. <laughs> and the woman is removed back to the dungeons. Once the girl has her audience, she jumps up onto a table and calmly denounces the woman as a witch. She's the woman's own daughter. Oh. And she's nine years old. Whoa. Janet Devis was a key witness in a trial that would lead to the execution of 10 people, including all members of her own family. Oh, wow. And 20 years later, Janet herself would come to be standing in the dock, charged with the same offense. Whoa. Okay, so sh this is a nine-year-old little girl that was the daughter of that woman and she basically, her testimony got all her family executed and and some other people's. Wow. That's crazy. And then she herself was, uh, wow, okay. Janet, a nine-year-old beggar, was part of a bigger story of justices, clerics, and physicians, even the king himself. Someone who would normally have been lost to history has lived on because of a chilling role in one of the most disturbing witch trials on record. This is a story about fear, politics and religion, science and magic. But to me, as a poet, it's also about words and stories and just how powerful they can be. The two trials that shape the life of this little girl are emblematic of a much bigger story, the transition between a pre-modern world and our supposed age of reason. And yet our fear of evil has never really gone away. Neither, some say, has evil itself. Fear of evil was endemic in England 400 years ago, when King James I was on the throne. James was living in fear of Catholic rebellion in the aftermath of the gunpowder plot. Recently arrived from Scotland, he was on the throne in a strange land, and some parts of his new kingdom were particularly troubling. Lancashire was a long way from London in many ways. Described by somebody at the time as a dark corner of the land, it had a reputation for disobedience, full of troublemakers and uh, subversives. Wow, it's beautiful. And this area, not far from where I live, We're in Rolling Hills, dominated by the strange brooding presence of Pendle Hill, was almost beyond the back of beyond. Pendle Hill. Today, I, okay. it's established an odd niche by trading on its dark past. Hmm. In 1612, 
The nine-year-old Janet Devis lived in obscurity at her grandmother's house, Malkin Tower. Malkin Tower. It sounds grand, but it really wasn't. Malkin was actually a 17th century word meaning slattern or slut, and it was still being used in these parts in the 20th century. Wait, is that, is that the house? Is that the house? Wow, if it is, definitely not the grand tower you would think it is, and also it's like just, wow, still standing. If the, I don't know why else he would be standing in front of the house if it wasn't. The house was also, uh, and even less grandly, referred to as Mocking Tower. And according to some people, and not to put too fine a point on it, Mocking is a local word for shit. Hmm. Wow. Nobody knows for sure where the house would have stood. Oh, so it's not. But recent okay. research suggests it may have been on this site. Okay, so it's not there anymore. Okay. Jenna and her family survived mainly by begging and by doing odd jobs for neighbours. But the family did have one other source of income and, I suppose, a kind of power. Janet's grandmother was well known locally as a cunning woman. And everyone knew her as old Demdike. The role of the cunning woman is an incredibly valuable one, especially for poor people who don't have recourse, say, to doctors. And there's all sorts of modern roles rolled up into one as sort of a social worker and a policewoman um, and doctor, all those things that give people a kind of security about their otherwise anxious lives. But it's, uh, it's a rather an ambiguous role because to be a cunning woman, the authorities would call it uh, witchcraft, really. So cunning women can get into trouble with the law if they fall out with their clients. To Janet and her family, it was a fact of life that a person might have the power to heal or harm through the use of charms or spells. To them, it wasn't mumbo jumbo, it was real, it happened. Witches are people who do bad things. Cunning women are people who do good things. Cunning women cure you and find your lost stuff. Witches steal stuff from you and make you sick or kill you. I think that's pretty, um, I don't know. I don't really agree with that particularly. I mean, like, I believe that plenty of people, you know, that are, that are kind of pagan, have pagan origins, probably call themselves witches. And... I don't think they're meaning bad or anything. I think that's just what they call themselves. And I, I, I don't know about you guys, but I do believe there is such a thing as, I believe what a lot of people uh, would call spells is more like a prayer. I believe that everything is some form of energy, therefore that, you know, we can send out, you know, this energy um, and, and cause things to happen. And sometimes those things could potentially be good or bad. You know, I don't have proof of that. I just think that's a possibility. But, uh, yeah, anyways. At Malkin Tower, Janet lived with her grandmother, her mother Elizabeth, and her elder sister and brother, Alison and James. There were no adult men. Elizabeth's husband had died 11 years earlier, and nine-year-old Janet wasn't his child. She grew up knowing that she was the runt of the litter and a bastard daughter of the house. I think that would have made her feel isolated, indifferent, mm. even cursed. In the later investigations, it became clear that Janet's world was populated by demons. Janet's grandmother was not the only cunning woman in the neighborhood. Old Chattox, the head of a nearby household, was a rival for her business, and the Devises believed her to be a witch. For some years, Elizabeth's husband had been making payments of oatmeal to Chattox. The year the payment was not made, he died. At most times in history, such family squabbles would have passed by unnoticed, but these weren't usual times. In 
England around 1600 as a country in the grip of conversion experience. Officially, it had turned Protestant about 40 years before, but it had taken two generations for that really to sink in. So around about 1600, a lot of the English were in the grip of enthusiastic Protestantism for the first time. And now that England was Protestant, Catholics were increasingly feared as seditious and evil. The idea that there are people out in Lancashire who are adhering to old religious ways can be transferred quite easily to the idea that these people are actually dangerous dissenters uh, who need to be suppressed. To devout English Protestants, the Bible brackets idolaters, heathen, sorcerers together. And so Catholicism, which is itself to Protestants a demonic religion, can come to look very closely related to witchcraft. These were wow. apprehensive times at court. Let me take a moment to appreciate this little tunnel of nature he's in. That's so beautiful. Wow. Uh, I just love things like that. Anyway. Throughout the country. And in that climate of fear, it didn't take much to arouse suspicion. On March 18th, 1612, Janet's teenage sister, Alison Devis, was out and about walking down a lane. Along the way, she met a peddler, and being a beggar, she asked the peddler for some pins, but he wouldn't open his pack, and he walked on. For Alison, this would have been an everyday experience. Probably several times a week, people would brush past her or ignore her, and she probably responded to their rudeness by cursing them. On March 18th, she cursed the peddler, and the curse seemed to work because he fell to the floor and unable to speak or move, he was eventually carried to a local inn. Wow. And Alison was terrified because she knew she'd bewitched him. She rushed to his bedside and begged for his forgiveness. From the legal records, we have a very detailed description of the peddler's condition following his collapse. His head is drawn awry, his eyes and face deformed, his speech not well to be understood, his arms lame, especially the left side. What would you say that that was a description of? I think there's very little doubt that those symptoms reflect the fact that he has had a stroke. The face being awry, the left arm not working. Mm, yeah. I mean, something coming on that suddenly wow. really can only be a stroke. Alison seemed convinced that she had caused this stroke uh, through bewitching him uh, and, and blamed herself and agonized over it. It, it. Is there any logic in that? From the description, it does sound as though the two events were significantly linked. Looking at it as a scientist, yes, the curse causing him to become very upset and to put the blood pressure up and to cause him to then have a stroke. Hmm. In exactly the same situation these days could happen as a result of road rage or an argument. Uh, uh, some devastating that's interesting. information hmm. being given to somebody can Maybe. result in people having a stroke. What's so striking for me is that Alison was in no doubt that she'd nearly killed a man. Perhaps she really had. It was her fear and her own contrition that would lead directly to a downfall, and that of all her family as well. The consequences of Alison's curse spiralled out of control when the peddler's outraged son reported the incident to an ambitious local magistrate, Roger Nowell. England has justice of the peace dotted all over the place, and they are the men who dispense the law. Some of them are not very good, some of them are very lazy, some of them are extremely zealous indeed. Roger Nowell is one of those zealous types. Mm. He's ambitious, he's a Protestant, and he sees that actually that his route to success in his career is to go out there, identify nonconformists, that could be witches or it could be Catholics, and bring them to justice. Wow. Roger Nowell began investigating. He interviewed Alison Davis, who, in her need to unburden herself, confessed to everything. But she also accused her neighbour, Chattox, of bewitching and killing four people and of making clay figures. 
Alison seems to have been seriously spooked by what she'd done to the peddler. I think it's likely that a little sister, Janet, would have been pretty freaked out by it too. Alison's statement escalated the investigation. Chattox and her daughter were very ready to point the finger back at the Devis family and accused Granny Demdike of witchcraft too. Nowell realised that he was no longer investigating a single incident, but was now heading up a major witch hunt, rooting the evil out of Pendle. On April the 2nd, Noel made his first arrests. Janet's sister and granny, as well as her neighbours, Chattox and Anne, were all shipped off to distant Lancaster Castle to await trial. Wow. Roger Noel was confident that these arrests would please the king. Just a year before the arrests in Pendle, the King James Bible was published and laid out oh. in stark words, <laughs> Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. I've come here to Oxford in search of a book, not the King James Bible, but a book James wrote himself. James I has a reputation as an avid witch hunter and participates personally in trials up in North Berwick. And he believes that witches are trying to kill him. In fact, that the, the witches tried to sink the boat that he was bringing his wife, Anne of Denmark, back on their honeymoon. He writes a slim, exciting book called Demonology, which is unique among heads of state in being a sole authored work upon the nature of hell and what to do about it. Wow. And it's pretty popular. It's readable, it's concise, it's I think learned. I've heard of that. It's actually a rather clever why. piece of work. And it's a mandate to the British to hunt witches. Wow, a mandate. This is an wow. original 1597 edition of James's Demonology. Uh, written, it says here at the beginning, because of the fearful abounding at this time in this country of these detestable slaves of the devil, the witches or enchanters. James is very much a product of the Presbyterian Kirk in Scotland. Presbyterian ministers who brought James up as Presbyterian in a bid to counteract the influence of his Catholic mother tell him stories all day about the power of the devil. They deliberately scare him, and it works. You can scare a child very easily. They talk him into feeling that he's surrounded by witches. The demonology might seem a bit like the ramblings of a paranoid man, but as the saying goes, just because you're paranoid, it doesn't mean that they're not out to get you. The religious tensions in England had reached boiling point just seven years earlier, when the king wow. and his entire parliament had very nearly been blown up by Guy Fawkes and his team of Catholic terrorists in the... Guy Fawkes, that's coming up. Um, it's bonfire night, I've heard about that. I'm, I'm gonna look at a video about that here soon. Um, again, I don't know anything about that either, I don't know, but sounds like it's some sort of, I don't know, we'll, we'll check that out later. <laughs> failed gunpowder plot. And although Fawkes had been captured, some of the conspirators were still at large. It's, like it's perfectly Fox. reasonable if you're an early modern monarch to be paranoid about people trying to kill you. And James is one of those monarchs, there's no shortage of potential conspiracies out there. He's got a dad who's been strangled after an attempt to blow him up, a mother whose head has been hacked off in an English prison, and there have been at least two attempts to kidnap him, maybe one to murder him. No wonder he's scared. And shortly after he arrives in England, some of his Catholic subjects try to blow him to smithereens, along with the rest of Parliament. He's a king who is exceptionally nervous of conspiracy. The plotters who were caught were trying to flee to safety and the place where they expected to find it was Lancashire. In March 1612, local JPs had received an order from London that they were to compile a report of all those who refused to take communion in church 
in an effort to root out the Lancashire Catholics. It was a crude, but hopefully effective, loyalty test. All those that do not come to the church and there communicate must be presented and further proceeded against. Fail not herein at your peril. And here, look, one of the order's signatories was Roger Noel. There's no question about it. On Good Friday, 1612, every loyal subject should have been in church. Wow. Instead, at Malkin Tower, Janet's mother threw a party, and to feed the guests, a brother stole a sheep. Of course, there would be friends absent from the gathering. Alison and Granny Demdike, along with the neighbours, were now awaiting trial in right. Lancaster Castle. What happened in that house on that day will become the subject of intense scrutiny over the following months. There were guests at Malkin Tower. Was it an Easter party? Just friends were out for lunch? Was it a solidarity meeting of those relatives of the prisoners held in Lancaster Castle? Or was it a gathering of witches? The local constable hears a whisper that there is a meeting of witches at Malkin Tower and arrives suddenly at the door with his men. Afterwards, with echoes of the recent gunpowder plot, they would be accused of conspiring to blow up Lancaster Castle and to murder its jailer. Everyone present was arrested, but the family at Malkin Tower did not come quietly. They told the constable that there'd be more people at the party who had left already. You'll never guess who you just missed. And so the others implicated were also arrested. They were all accused of plotting to kill a man by witchcraft. Wow. By the time he'd finished, Noel had sent another eight people to join the original four in Lancaster Castle. It was all going so much better than he could have hoped. Unlike some of the people detained, Janet Devis was definitely a Malkin Tower on Good Friday, 1612. But she wasn't taken away with the others. Who was she with? The people rounded up at the party were from the lowest possible walks of life. But the others arrested were different. Alice Nutter was from a respectable landowner. Wasn't Janet nine years old? Like, and if and everybody else was taken away, was she just left by herself? She had to be left with someone. ...family, and was arrested along with her sister-in-law, her nephew, and a friend. The Nutters are still in the area. Colin Nutter lives here, and many other relatives live nearby, and always have. Collins, the Yorkshireman, I think I'm right in saying that there aren't many nutters in Yorkshire, but there are quite a few over here, aren't there? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes, there are quite a lot of them here. <laughs> so how did somebody like Alice Nutter come to be caught up in the witch trials? I think she was uh, in the wrong place at the wrong time, really, with Alice Nutter. What would Roger Noel's motivation have been? The Nutters at that point were a strong Catholic family, and uh, I think he would he would curry favour with the king and the, and the powers that be if he catching Catholics as well, you see. She had two relatives who were priests who were hung, drawn and quartered. Mm. And one of them in Tyburn and one in Lancaster. So as far as Noel was concerned, she was just a, another one of these troublemaking Catholics then? Exactly, and she would be used as a pawn for his own ends, really. Mm. It seems pretty unlikely to me that Alice Nutter and her friends spent Good Friday eating stolen mutton at shit towers with the local beggars. But whatever the truth, they were rounded up, arrested, and taken to Lancaster Castle. Mm, like Lancaster Catherine. Castle has remained a working prison right up until spring of 2011. Really? Wow. This is still known as the Witch's Tower. That would be an interesting, if you had to be in prison, that would be a very interesting prison to be in. 
Wow, so old. The castle is huge, but the cell that they were held in wasn't. Inside it were all of Janet's family. A gran, a mother, a brother, a sister, plus all the neighbors, Chattox, Anne, Isabel Roby, Margaret Pearson, Alice Nutter, John and Jane Bullcock, and Catherine Hewitt, plus eight other prisoners. Oh, wow. Space, 20 feet by 12 feet. Oh, wow. 20 people in all. Man, did you say 20 That's people? We don't know where she's been. one square foot per person. Her family were imprisoned. Or roughly. It's possible that she lived under the protection wow. of Roger Knoll as she was about to become crucial to the case he was building. Man, it's beautiful. Everywhere is beautiful the around there. Magistrate would have been well aware of the king's thoughts on witch hunting. Right at the end of his demonology, King James wrote something that became especially relevant for the case of the Pendle witches. And here it is. Here's what the, the king says. In my opinion, barns or wives are never so defamed persons, that's children, women and liars, all lumped in together, um, may of our law serve for sufficient witnesses and proofs in matters of high treason against God. That's telling Noel and other magistrates in the country two really important things, that witchcraft is treason, not just against the king, but by extension, also against God himself. And secondly, he's saying the law should allow children to testify in court. And it wasn't just Noel who was influenced by King James's demonology. It would also influence the professional justice system. Everything we know about this whole story comes from one book, The Wonderful Discovery of Witches in the County of Lancaster. It was written by one Thomas Potts while serving as clerk to the court when the prisoners went on trial in 1612. He kept his notes of the trial and wrote them all up to demonstrate the rigor of the trial proceedings. He also dedicated the book to his patron, Thomas Nivett, Nivet was the man who arrested Guy Fawkes. Potts was making a clear connection for the reader between witches and Catholics as traitors or terrorists. Wow. The whole book is an exercise in political brown-nosing. Nonetheless, it represents an extraordinarily detailed account of a 17th century witch trial. courtroom of Lancaster Castle on the 18th of August 1612 the trial of the Pendle witches began the room is still a working court wow. in 1612 it wouldn't have looked still much like this wow nonetheless there was a judge uh, in fact two judges in this case hmm. uh, a jury witnesses and the defendants and all Wow, that, I bet you go into that courtroom and, you know, I believe that energy sometimes stays in certain areas. I believe it almost always stays in certain areas if some if there was a lot of powerful, like, emotion behind something going on. And so I bet you can feel the energy, the thickness in a room like that still. It's just, hmm. All the while. Thomas Potts was scribbling the verbatim notes, which would become his best-selling book. Mm. The outcome of the trial was far from being a foregone conclusion. Probably less than half of accused witches actually are convicted and executed. And the, the set of records which we have, which are very reliable for this, suggests that it's probably more like a 75% acquittal rate. Whatever the odds, for Janet's sister, whose curse had started the whole affair, it's interesting. things didn't look good. That's actually really interesting. Um, you know, you get this kind of, well, at least I do, I get this kind of impression that back in, you know, hundreds of years ago when, you know, there were, people were so fearful of, of witchcraft and things like that, 
Um, I just had the impression that it was like almost everybody who got caught being a witch was, was, you know, tried and executed, but they're making it sound like that's not the case. That was actually, um, a, a much smaller percentage of, of those people who got caught and then they went to trial and then they were acquitted. Hmm. So interesting. Poor Alison Davis. She didn't even want to defend herself. She was completely convinced of her own guilt. Her words had caused the peddler How to How old was she? And that terrified her. She was asked in court if through her magic power she could restore the peddler to his health and strength, but regretfully she said that she couldn't. She did say though, and others agreed with her, that her grandmother would have been able to help him. But in the four months of waiting for the trial to begin, Granny Demdike had died in the tiny, filthy cell. Mm. Thomas Potts had some sympathy for Alison. He liked his witches desperate and contrite. Her mother was neither, and Potts was vile about her. He wrote that this odious witch was branded with a preposterous mark in nature, which was her left eye standing lower than the other, the one looking down, the other looking up. So strangely deformed, as the best that were present did affirm that they had not often seen the like. 400 years ago, it wasn't common for a witness to be brought to testify in the courtroom itself. But on the 18th of August, 1612, a star witness was being prepared to take the stand. Elizabeth Devis was furious and protested her innocence. But then a nine-year-old daughter, Janet, was brought to testify against her. Man. Elizabeth was distraught. She yelled at her desperately. Janet burst into tears. She was only a little girl after all, wow. before turning to the judge and asking that her mother be taken away before she would speak. Once Elizabeth had been silenced and Janet had her audience, she jumped up onto a table and calmly denounced her own mother as a witch. Hmm. When I was a probation officer many moons ago, I spent a lot of time sitting in the Crown Courts of Lancashire, a lot of them old and intimidating cockpits like this. And some of the cases involved evidence from children and of course the legal system these days is very sensitive in its handling of young people. We'll never know why Janet Devis said what she said, but standing on the table, centre stage in the middle of this moral and political and legal drama, I can't help think that she was reciting her lines. My mother is a witch, and that I know to be true. I have seen her spirit in the likeness of a brown dog, which she called Ball. That's what I was thinking. Perhaps, um... She was kind of coached by somebody because, I mean, it's like I'm thinking nine years old, you're going to come up and get your mother and accuse her of something at the time, which would have, you know, I don't know if a nine year old understood. Maybe they would have understood that's possibly could get her mother executed or but at the very least, I'm thinking she probably would have understood that, you know, it would have took her mother away. So either her mother did some really bad things to her or she had been coached saying that that was going to protect her mother. I don't know, that's that's interesting. The dog did ask what she would have him do, and she answered that she would have him help her to kill John Robinson of Barley, James Robinson, Henry Mitten. Janet went on to describe the meeting at Malkin Tower on Good Friday. At 12 noon, about 20 people came to our house. My mother told me that they were all witches. She described the food they ate and named six people she'd seen there whose names she knew, as well as a mother and brother. There's a kind of a, a paradox surrounding the evidence of children in the courtroom. On the one hand, they're seen as unreliable because they're so young, but on the other hand, they're seen as pure witnesses of the truth. 
Yeah. And so that in somebody like Janet Davis, there's something horrific about exploiting a child who is so young. And I think people may have felt that at the time too. But at the same time, um, she could well be the means to cracking open this secret ring of witchcraft. It wasn't just Janet who testified against Elizabeth. Her son James denounced her too. He said that three skulls had been robbed from graves at the new church in Pendle, and four of the teeth then kept at Malkin Tower. Four teeth were then presented in court, which had been mm. found at Malkin Tower by the constable, alongside a clay figure, all buried together in the ground. But giving evidence against his mother wouldn't help him, because Janet turned on her own brother too. Janet said that James had been a witch for three years. She had seen his spirit kill three people. She then went on to recite charms she said she'd heard her brother use. Upon Good Friday, I will fast while I may. A cross of blue and another of red, as good Lord was to the rude. Gabriel laid him down to sleep upon the ground. What we've got here is a series of half understood, maybe quarter understood recollections of prayers, practices, rites of popular Catholicism, and a bit of a playtext. That I can neither sleep nor wake. Rise up, Gabriel, All and go swirled with me. together into something that would sound impressive to a listener as a healing charm. Sweet Jesus, our Lord, amen. Potts was impressed by Janet's testimony. In fact, he seemed to relish her calm, clear and chilling account. Although she were but very young, yet it was wonderful to the court with what modesty, government and understanding she delivered this evidence against the prisoner at the bar, being her own natural brother. Wow. An adult would know that what they were saying was likely to lead to mum and grandma being hanged. And I don't think Janet did really know in the way an adult would know. I think she only knew it intellectually and not emotionally. Right, yeah. Um, and that's why I think her mother screams at her in the way she does. I think her mother is desperately trying at least to make her realise what she's done. She's clearly a rather odd child. She's extremely articulate. She clearly doesn't like her family. Hmm. She's a bit different from the others. Uh, we don't know who her father was. Uh, she's the only illegitimate child. And clearly either she's really terrified of the magistrates and determined to save herself at all costs, or more probably, it gives her a chance for all sorts of concealed resentments and animosities against wow. her family to explode lethally. I think we need to imagine that she believes in the reality of witchcraft and that these people really are witches and that she seeks to distance herself from them. Of course, she's also being put under a great deal of pressure. It may be direct pressure, it may just be the atmospheric pressure of the courtroom, the tension of all these men around her or telling her that in fact the witchcraft has taken place and that she's the linchpin uh, in punishing it. It wasn't just her own family Janet was prepared to denounce as witches. Alice Nutter and her friends were more well-to-do, and the judge was more demanding of evidence against them. He arranged identity parades, mixing them in with other prisoners from the castle. <laughs> one by one, Janet picked them out. You were there on Good Friday. You had on the prettiest dress. You ate the mutton. You were sitting right by me. In an attempt to catch her out, the judge then asked, did you see Joanna's style, a made-up name? No, sir, I never heard of her. Most of the early modern witch hunters rely on the Bible and or the texts by the great continental demonologists as their texts. The Lancashire witch trials are really unusual in that they ignore these pretty well completely and fasten on the king's own book, King James's Demonology. And in a way that's extremely rare, they're plainly ticking boxes. 
King James says, witches use body parts for evil magic. Body parts are found, the Lancashire witches' property. They make clay images. Whoops, it's what Lancashire witches are supposed to be doing. Children are extremely useful as witnesses. Wow, we suddenly have Janet. So what these people are doing is looking upwards to the monarch as their fount of wisdom. The evidence against the prisoners had stacked up perfectly. We tend to assume that witchcraft was just one big delusion and therefore that the witches who were convicted were in fact innocent. But accused witches believed in witchcraft too. And I think it's improbable that, to think that witches never tried to use magic in order to kill somebody. Well, today we prosecute people and punish them if they attempt a crime but are unsuccessful. So the witches of 1612, by that measure, were they innocent? At the end of the two-day trial, the jury had decided that all of Janet's family and most of her neighbours were guilty of causing death or harm by witchcraft. Ten people were sentenced to hang. Elizabeth Devis, Alison Devis, James Devis, Anne Whittle, Anne Redfern, Isabel Roby, Alice Nutter, Jane Bullcock, John Bullcock, Catherine Hewitt. Wow. The day after the trial, the 10 convicted prisoners were brought to a place still known as Gallows Hill. This was a piece of state theater. This was the moment when the majesty of God and the majesty of the law were very much focused on this one event and everybody could see the power of it. At the critical moment, the witch was led out, forced to climb the ladder, the noose put over her neck, and then at that moment, the crowd went rather quiet. I can imagine. That's and surreal. They didn't die from having a neck broken, but from slow strangulation that might take as long as 20 minutes. In fact, oh. there are accounts of friends and family coming forward and pulling on the legs uh, of the poor person being executed oh, in wow. order to hasten their end. Condemned prisoners were expected to make one final confession. It was a last chance to save their souls, though not, of course, their lives. We're told that Elizabeth and Alice Nutter never confessed, not even with their dying words. I think it's probably very likely, based on the standards of the day, that Janet would have been encouraged to be there too. A lot of history's most ghastly locations are completely transformed now. This is a, a park where kids come to play football and do whatever kids do in parks these days. For me, the most chilling thought about what happened here was the idea that Janet might well have been watching the hangings and the last thing mm -hmm. that Elizabeth might have seen as she looked out from the gallows might have been the face of her daughter, the child who put her there. Wow. Man. We don't know anything about what happened to the orphaned Janet Devis in the years that followed the execution of her entire family and most of her neighbors. It's difficult to imagine anybody wanting to take her in, but it could be argued that they weren't her last victims. Yeah, that, that is Thanks an interesting thing about. published account, Janet's influence would travel far beyond Lancashire. Although there had been earlier cases of children being heard as witnesses in witch trials, the law stated that children under the age of 14 were not credible witnesses as they could not be sworn under oath. Mm -hmm. But that was set to change. Imagine you're a 17th century JP or magistrate. You're not trained in the law like the judges are, but you need to investigate, question witnesses, and compile a case for the assize. What you need is one handy book that gives you all the basics, something that you can just pull off the shelf whenever you need it. The Country Justice is that book. 
is by mm. a man called Dalton wow. and was first published in 1618. <laughs> this handbook was used by all magistrates both here and in the colonies in America. You've got some people accused of witchcraft. Uh, so you look up advice on witnesses, see page 541. And here it is. For children, I find in the book of the discovery of witches at Lancaster Assizes, that's Thomas Potts's book, that the son and daughter, that's Janet and James, of Elizabeth Devis, a witch, here we go, the one about nine years of age, the other of 14, did upon their oaths give open evidence against their mother, then prisoner at the bar. So what Janet did in 1612 ended up giving a precedent to magistrates, not just mm. here, but across the Atlantic, to seek the testimony of children in trials of witchcraft. Wow. And before we say that this is outrageous, let's remember that today there are still trials which rely on child testimony sure. due yeah. to lack of alternative witnesses. It's true. Today, the testimony of children as young as three has been used in criminal trials. The law says that they mm. have to understand the questions put to them and to give answers which are understandable. I. I don't know. I mean, I I think children at a certain age could definitely be a witness in a trial. But I think if you're talking about kids as young as three, I don't know, three-year-olds, uh, <laughs> you know, they their their <laughs> their imagination is insane. So if you just if someone just said a few words to them, it can completely alter their memory of something. I mean, even adults' memory can be altered pretty easily by the right person, person who, you know, kind of knows how to do that. But a, a child's memory, especially three, four, five years old, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I would trust them to be a good witness. Eh, I think if you're talking about nine or ten, you could perhaps start relying on them at that point. But anyway. And the most extraordinary thing was that Janet herself would come to fall victim to the very precedent she set. In November 1633, 22 years after the nine-year-old Janet testified against her family, so she's 31. a 10-year-old boy from Pendle came home late one evening and told his parents a very strange story. Edmund Robinson explained that the reason he was late was that he'd been picking berries. And while gathering berries, he said he'd seen two greyhounds. I tried to get them to chase a hare, but they didn't run, so I beat them with a stick. Mm. One of the dogs turned into a witch and the other into a boy, and she then turned him into a horse. <laughs> The witch took me away on the horse to that house, Horse Stones. And their barn was full of witches, maybe 60 of them. And what? from the ceiling there were all these ropes hanging down. And they were pulling on the ropes, and amazing food came falling down. I was so frightened so I ran away, and they chased me for ages. And before I got home, I met a boy with cloven hooves, so I fought him. That's why I'm so scruffy. It's not my fault. All of which seems to have been accepted as a genuine reason for lateness, somewhat surprisingly. Yeah, I mean... I, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I don't know about all that. Uh, that just seems over the top. That just seems like a kid's imagination right there. Like, that's insane. Now I will say the the was it a boy with a cloven cloven hooves? I I do. It makes me think of a story. I just want to interrupt this and say say this little story real quick um, because it it ties into what you know he was just talking about there. I remember my dad uh, used to talk about this area out where he grew up, which. Was you know it was in the same it was on the outskirts of the town I grew up in so it was kind of out in the countryside and uh, him and his two brothers one was 
dead at this point, but the other the other brother was still alive. Um, they were out uh, walking down way out in the middle of these fields. I, I can't even explain how far from the house they were, lived at and whatnot. Um, there's a lot of land out there. So, um, but to make a long story short, um, him and his brother came across what he says was this almost like a man, a half man, half horse looking animal, like huge. So it was huge. It was black. And um, I just thought that was interesting. Uh, you know, I'm like, yeah, okay. <laughs> Uh, just thinking it was my my dad. He was probably, I don't know, 12 at the time. and um, But I verified with his brother, which would have been 16-ish at the time. And he remembered the same story. They both saw this half-man, half-clothed hoof animal thing. Uh, and they booked it and ran and ran and ran back back home. Um, it spooked them so bad. So, you know, at first I thought my dad was, it was his imagination, but then I verified with my, my uncle and sure enough, he remembered the same thing. I didn't even tell him all the details. He told me the same details that my dad had told, told me. Um, so I thought that was interesting. So yeah, just interesting. I wonder if there is some sort of creature that has existed that is half animal, half human, or something. Hmm. Anyway, enough of that. Let's let's continue. <laughs> After hearing this story, the boy's father took him from village to village to stand in the churches and point out the witches he had seen for three months. The curate of a local church described seeing Edmund at work. The boy was brought into the church of Kildwick and was set upon a stall to look about him, which moved some little disturbance in the congregation for a while. And after prayers, the people told me that it was the boy that discovered witches. On the evidence of Edmund's bizarre story, about 20 people were imprisoned and put on trial in February 1634. One of them was called Janet Devis, accused of killing Isabel, wife of William Nutter. Mm. I can see absolutely no reason to think that it's not the same Janet Devis from the earlier Lancashire trial that's accused by Edmund Robinson. But the fact that someone of the same name appears uh, as a suspect in the second trial with some of the same families involved in the same place. I think it's very suggestive. And the same age she would be, no supposedly? That it's not her. Same area, same name, Again, same age? It's the stories yeah. the children tell that have such an incredible power. Not only Edmund's story in 1633, but the words Janet used back in 1612 have returned to haunt her. She'd been a witness for the Crown as a nine-year-old and had been spared the noose. But this time, surely, she'd hang. Yet these were different times, and England had changed since 1612. Mm. When we look back into the 17th century, we think of uh, what happened before the 17th century. We think of a world where witches were persecuted, where people relied on what other people said, everybody was suspicious, everybody was very uncertain. It was a time of great political and religious uncertainty. And then when you look forward to the 18th century, you've got a sense of order and stability. So the 17th century was a period of transition. When Thomas Potts wrote his book, he thought he'd be pleasing the king with his account. But James's continued interest in witch trials led him to become more skeptical. Something very important happens mm. at Leicester in 1616. A boy, maybe 12, 13 years old, claims that he's bewitched. The case goes to trial, uh, and nine women are hanged. Well, the following month, James wow. I goes to Leicester. He interviews the boy and discovers that he's lying. 
Oh, and man. As a consequence, the judges mm. are very soundly rebuked. And this goes out as a message to other judges to be very, very cautious in witchcraft cases, particularly if your star witness happens to be a child. Wow. And by the time Edmund told the story crazy. in 1633, a new king was on the throne. Charles I was even more doubtful about witch hunting than his father had become. And his attitude towards religion was so different from his father's that many suspected him of being a Catholic. His wife certainly was. Crudely, it's true that the most radical Protestants, the people we call Puritans, are the most concerned about the devil and demons. And as Charles I is a king who is deeply suspicious of Puritanism, he's pretty suspicious of accounts of demons. So here we are, 22 years later, back in the courtroom. Just as before, a jury listened to a child telling stories of witches, but this time, Janet was in the dock. And just as before, the jury believed the child to be honest and the prisoners evil. On Edmund's testimony, 17 people were found guilty and should have been sentenced to death. But in this new kind of England, this changed England, the judges weren't happy with these verdicts and the matter was referred to London, to the King and the Privy Council. Mm -hmm. Four were sent from Lancashire to London. By the way, the Privy Council, that's basically the king's, the, the, the wise people he supposedly he surrounds himself with, correct? It's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like the cabinet of a, of a U.S. president in a way, right? It's kind of like who he gets his advice from. So this is, uh, is, that, is, that, is that accurate? But not Janet. She was one of those who waited behind in the castle, where several prisoners had already died of jail fever during the 15 months they'd spent there. Wow. Is that the actual uh, London in place she was staying? London in 1934 would have been another world for the women of Lancashire. When they arrived, the four were held in the Fleet Jail. While they were there, a pair of playwrights immediately produced a play called The Witches of Lancashire, featuring the story told by Little Edmund. They got the play on stage so quickly that while the women were behind bars, on show to the public for a penny or two, the piece was already being performed. Londoners could go to the jail in the morning to go up at a witch or a northerner, and then go and see a play about them in the afternoon. It was the complete entertainment package. Hmm. Aha! Aha! There! The devil take these cars, will they not stir? I'll see if I can put spirit into you and put you in remembrance what halloo halloo means. Now bless me heaven, one of the greyhounds turned into a woman and the other into a boy. You have served me well to swinge me thus. You young rogue, you have used me like a dog. Oh, not you a witch. The power of stories never ceases to amaze me. A young lad in rural Lancashire tells his tall tale. The next minute, it's a play in London. Help! Help! Huh. It's interesting that although in 1634 most people still believed in witches, they were able to laugh at them. That would never have happened in 1612. Huh, that's interesting. That's interesting, that transition in such a relatively short period of time. This new way of looking at the world was also apparent in the advances being made by scientists, years, which would, roughly? over the century, transform our understanding of nature. Scientific research and experimentation did not banish a belief in witchcraft and superstition overnight. Far from it, but it did provide serious tools for trying to tell the innocent from the guilty. These were applied in 1634 to those women from Lancashire accused of witchcraft. And this was one of the earliest ever cases of what came to be known as forensic science, science relating to the law courts.
1612 trial represents an older way of thinking where everything was based on credulity, superstition, uh, everybody willing to believe everything nasty that was said. And by the time you get to 1634, although it's by, absolutely by no means a scientific era, it seems as though people are behaving in a, in a more rational way and they're demanding what we would think of as scientific, forensic, objective evidence. What is shifting in the 17th century, slowly and by fits and starts, is a belief that you have to demonstrate something physically, that if you can't demonstrate it in medicine, you cannot use it as evidence. In other words, that there may be an invisible world of spirits around you, but you have to prove physical effect in order to bring them into a law court. Mm. Mm, King yeah. James had written in his Demonology see. that one good way to identify a witch is to look for witch's marks, a place on the body where you could see a teat that had been used by the devil to suckle. All the accused people from Lancashire were examined for these marks, including Janet. Here it says they found Janet Devis, two paps or marks in her secrets. I think secrets means probably exactly what you think it means. The other four people brought to London also had their marks listed. Uh, for example, Margaret Johnson, one mark or pap betwixt her seat and her secrets. That is so odd. It's like, what are these marks they're seeing? You know, like, are they just straight up lying about these supposed marks? Because, I mean, I can't imagine there were actually these marks, these weird marks on these women. That's so interesting. I wonder what that means. Now, King Charles wanted his own trusted physician, William Harvey, to re-examine the women. William Harvey is one of the great medical Brits of all time. He is most known for discovering how the blood circulates through the body. He takes his place up there with people like Isaac Newton and Christopher Wren as one of the new forward-looking people of the 17th century who are plugging into a European will to do things better than ever before. Harvey was sent on more than one occasion to examine witches on the king's orders. There was a village witch who had a toad as her familiar, not an unfamiliar situation. Um, and William Harvey caught the toad and dissected the toad and then showed the dissection to the witch to prove to her that it was just a normal toad, that there was nothing supernatural about it. And the woman flew at him and tried to virtually tear his skin off with her nails. You killed my toad! She wasn't in the slightest bit grateful that he'd brought science and rationality to her aid. From her point of view, he'd killed her pet and probably removed the foundation stone of her business. Mm. Here in London, Harvey recruited five physicians and ten female midwives to conduct the examination. This time, almost all of the previously suspicious marks were deemed to be nothing unnatural. OK, all right, and all right, so... This is actually the way in which witch hunting becomes undone. It's not so much people going in straight for the core and saying, we don't believe in witchcraft. It's people saying we need to be much more careful about how we prosecute. Right. And standards of evidence need, need to be raised. I mean, people... And if you raise a yeah. standard of proof high enough in witch trials, they come to an end altogether. According to William Harvey and his scientific team, there was no physical evidence against any of the prisoners. Everything now rested solely on the evidence of the child. In 1612, Janet Devis had been unflappable in court, cool and consistent. But in 1634, under examination from the Privy Council and the Secretary of State, 10-year-old Edmund Robinson cracked. He said that the story he'd told was inspired by stories he'd heard about the Devis family. Yeah, very good. He had heard the okay. neighbours talk of a witch feast that was kept at Mocking Tower in Pendle Forest about 20 years since. And cross-questioning established that Edmund's father had been blackmailing the women, getting his son to accuse any who refused oh. to pay. The Robinson family had some fine new cows. Man. Janet and the other prisoners were acquitted of witchcraft. For me, the story's remarkable, 
because the tale told by Jennet in 1612 had such resonance, it took on a life of its own in Pendle and refused to go away. Wow. Edmund accused Jennet of witchcraft precisely because her story had been so convincing and so compelling. Her own words were almost the death of her. Since the time of Janet Devis, we have become less credulous of magic and more rigorous in our demand for empirical evidence. In our modern technological age, we pride ourselves on our rationality and scientific understanding of the world. Some things don't change. Many people still believe in evil, although of course, where that evil occurs tends to change from year to year and community to community. Child killers, drug dealers, paedophiles, terrorists. Many still consider such evil to be the work of the devil. Believe it or not, the Church of England continues to perform exorcisms. Now, as then, we have fear, and at times of crisis, fear still leads to miscarriages of justice. When we hear a story like the Lancashire Wick trials from the first half of the 17th century, it's easy to feel distance from this strange alien world where people believe... It really wasn't that long ago. Believe I mean, it is long, but we might consider to be not a barbaric. big team of things. But of course, in the post 9-11 world, in the era of the war on terror, it's still quite easy to build policy on paranoia and therefore to overreact in certain situations and to infringe civil liberties in the name of security. Mm. So that in situations where we do feel threatened by the enemy within, the people all around us who might be trying to undermine Western civilization, we can easily find ourselves behaving in ways which are frighteningly similar to the ways in which some of those people behaved in Pendle um, in 1612 or 1633. So what about Janet Devis, the Lancashire child at the heart of this story? Did she walk away from two witch trials unscathed? Perhaps. In the prison records of 1636, Janet and some of the others acquitted of witchcraft were still imprisoned. Wow. Lancaster Castle inmates had to pay for their board and stay until the debt was cleared which for someone like Janet might have been impossible. There are really? no more records of Janet Devis after 1636, but huh. we do know that her legacy lived on. 3,000 miles from Lancaster, 19 people were hanged in 1692. These witch trials in Salem, Massachusetts, were perhaps the most infamous in history. Most of the evidence was given by children. Mm. On the Salem magistrate's table was Dalton's country justice, suggesting children were suitable witnesses in trials of witches, and citing Janet Devis, wow. 1612. Four hundred years ago, the idea of witches in one's midst must have been terrifying. But for us today, I think it's the enigma of Janet Devis herself which we find so disturbing. We'll never know why she said what she said, but that desire to believe her was born out of the kind of wild and irrational fear that can turn neighbor against neighbor and relative against relative and can make, well, demons out of all of us. Maybe it's because our protective instincts are so strong and our imagination so powerful but we still that is true about the human imagination. Fear during times of crisis, times when the truth can be the hardest thing of all to divine. Wow. That was interesting to say the least. They're bored. Oops. That was interesting to say the least, guys. Um, so I wonder what ever happened to Janet. Obviously, doesn't seem like. They, had, they could find records on her after, what was it, 1637, I think it was? So you got to wonder, 
if she was telling the truth when she was nine years old, and if later on as, as an adult she felt guilty, if this was a form of karma, if you will, to have this trial uh, come after her. And that's interesting. So, so if she was acquitted, she still had to stay in prison basically till she paid off a debt, even though she wasn't guilty, supposedly. That's something I'm not really sure about. Does anybody know what he meant there? Like, even if, if someone went to, if someone got um, charged with something, they went to jail, you know, they're in, they're in their cell. They ended up getting acquitted, but they still have to pay some sort of fees for the time they were in jail, wrongly charged. And if they can't, they just stay in there until they work it off or something. Wow. That's harsh, man. I mean, if you're innocent, you know, if you're get acquitted, basically you're innocent, then uh, I don't know if that's exactly what he was saying, but that's, that's really interesting if that's the case. But yeah, I wonder whatever happened to her. And it's interesting how her nine-year-old words, her, her voice at nine years old ended up killing many, getting many people executed. Because it was her that got the, the women that were executed in Salem, Massachusetts. Um, it was her testimony that ultimately they looked at to, to execute those women in Salem. So, I mean, who knows how many, how many people, her testimony at nine years old, over the next, you know, well, Salem was not 1692. We'll just say over a, a hundred years or less, 75 years, something like that. How many people did her testimony end up being called on in a way to say, yeah, we can trust these child witnesses uh, to be accurate? That's insane. Wow. I now totally understand why this was called the Pendle Witch Child instead of just talking about the Pendle Witch Trial because she um, was very influential, not just in that original trial, but throughout a longer period of time. And even today, because it's truth, truthfully, her nine-year-old testimony is what ended up to modern times looking at children as reliable witnesses. That's insane. Hmm. Anyways, guys, what do you guys think about, I don't know, uh, spells and things like that? Um, you know, he, he asked, he talked about evil, and obviously I believe that evil exists. I do believe that evil exists. You, you, you have to call some of these really bad people bad things. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not even going to go into detail about what some people do. We all know, you know, some of the worst atrocities mankind has committed. You have to call that something, and... and I, I think the best word to call those some of these things are evil, you know, but I think so many people, I've, I'm, I'm glad I live in a society now that people can practice their religion, whatever they choose it to be, uh, without fear of some of the things that happened back in the 1600s or, or earlier. Um, because I, I think that, you know, I, I have some superstitions, but, um, you know, there's a difference between being super, thinking someone is um, practicing some sort of magic and then thinking they're evil. That's two different things. Someone can someone can believe in magic and believe in all sorts of different things. And uh, some pe some people are pagan. You know, I'm not particularly pagan. I'm I was raised Christian, but I'm I'm okay with people being who they want to be and and having whatever religion they want to have. Um, you know, I, I believe that everybody should be able to kind of, for the most part, live the way they want to live unless they're obviously, you know, unless it's proven that they're actually trying to hurt someone or have hurt someone. Um, you know, if someone hurts somebody or tries to hurt someone, obviously they need, um, you know, to be punished in some way. Um, but people that just live in their lives and they believe in magic or whatever, that's that's their thing, you know. That has nothing to do with anybody else. So, um, anyways, guys, thank you for stopping by and joining me. Please click that like button. Feel free to leave your comments and suggestions about this video or other things you may think I'd be interested in checking out. 
And please don't forget to subscribe to continue to join me on my journey to discover my British and Irish ancestry. Until next time, guys. Peace.